Welcome back to Comic Book News and our continuing coverage of House of X and Powers of X. Today, Powers of X number five. But first, I'd like to take a moment to welcome all you new folks who might be joining us for the first time. We've noticed uh, the YouTube algorithms are picking up on our content and spreading it far and wide. So if you haven't already, take a minute, subscribe to this channel, hit like if you like the video. Hey, click dislike if you don't. And uh, click that little bell if you want to get notifications of new videos as soon as we drop them. And now, without further ado, let's take a look at Powers of X number five. Hey, welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about Powers of X number five. Uh, Powers of X, as you may recall, is the companion series to House of X. House of X is set in the current timeline and continuity of the X-Men. And Powers of X goes in back and forth in time and looks at various uh, past, present, and futures of this and other timelines. Are you confused yet? Uh, I know I can get a little bit confused with this stuff. But, you know, talking about this stuff with you guys and piecing together all the little clues that Hickman's been dropping um, has been a lot of fun and I'm really enjoying it. So, hey, let's cut the uh, jawbone in and get straight into the Million Dollar Comics cam. Powers of X number five. They will think we're doing one thing, but the truth is we're doing something altogether different. Professor X. Ain't it the truth, Charlie? P Powers of X number five, another two-page title spread. Uh, this series is known for its liberal use of graphic design elements and additional text pieces. Today we're going to quickly go through some of the uh, plot points of this issue and then we'll go back and go in a little more detail into the text pieces and, and maybe speculate on what some of it might mean. We start off uh, at X-Zero. This is X-Men Year One. This is the, f uh, the first year that Professor X decided to found the, the X-Men. And here we see him in conversation with Forge. Now that's kind of news to me because I, I, I thought of Forge as someone who came along later in uh, Xavier's life. I, that, that may have come in later years. It may have been revealed that they've known each other for a long time. Apparently they have. And uh, in this conversation, they talk about the upgrades to Cerebro that uh, Charles has in mind. Now, Cerebro, of course, is meant to be able to detect mutants. That's how we've known it all these years. But we found out in our last review that uh, Cerebro has a dual purpose. The other purpose uh, is to be able to back up the complete mind and emotions and emotional state, the, 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 the inner being of any mutant or Potentially, I suppose, any person, but in this case, specifically for mutants, for the purposes of reincarnating them by taking that consciousness and uh, reinserting it into a newly grown or cloned husk body. Okay, so what we see here is uh, Professor X first broaching the idea with Forge, basically coming up with the idea that, um, you know, Forge says, of course, you know, anything is possible, but it's all about the specifics, right? How do we how do we store that much data, for one thing? And Professor X is like, well, I happen to know about these Shi'ar memory crystal deals. So um, we've established the basic uh, kind of future technology that allows them to quickly store all this, what must be, you know, uh, insane amounts of data, right? So... Forge takes it kind of like a technical challenge and Professor X sort of challenges him in that way. The conversation is really great where Professor X is like, look, I don't know the the technical jargon or how this is going to work, but I know you know Forge and I can give you the pieces that you need to put this all together, right? And uh, that gets us to our first text piece on Cerebro, um, w which has some really interesting stuff, right? Um, we're going to come back to this. This is really important. Um, next, we go on to see another sort of foundational second layer of this new um, society of mutants, and that's uh, Emma Frost. So this goes back to uh, year X-Men year 10, which is roughly our current timeline, right? And so this shows how uh, Emma Frost was sort of clued in to what um, Xavier and Magneto have in mind. And basically, you know, 
she's like, you know, you guys are not being very subtle, Charles. I, you know, everybody knows something is going on. And this is where they first reveal to her their whole idea of uh, the the Krakoan spawn drugs and bringing people in um, in exchange for amnesty and acceptance of mutants. And she sort of calls out something that I, I thought was really interesting. She's like, look, you want to put them all on a, all the mutants on a big island? Haven't we been there before? Did Genosha mean nothing to you guys? It seems like, you know, put them all in one place and we're a big target. Um, anyway, uh, they're able to convince her, basically, uh, somehow by using this Krakoan flower to convince her of that theirs is the one true way. She joins on board with a few conditions, right? The whole idea here is that they realize that, you know, if we're going to essentially be a giant drug company now, right? We're going to sell drugs all over the world to all these different nations. We don't have expertise in that. We need somebody who has a mechanism for that. We need somebody who's experienced in the world of international business. And in the mutant world, that would be the Hellfire Club, right? Of which Emma Frost is the current leader. She's bounced back and forth as White Queen Apparently, recently, there was some sort of coup and she ousted Sebastian Shaw, the Black King. And in this, uh, they they say, look, we need you to bring him back in. We need you to bring Sebastian Shaw back into the fold for this reason. Because we need the Hellfire Club to work with all the nations that have accepted us, that have accepted the mutants and are willing to trade. Okay, the Hellfire Club will set up that business. But for all those countries that haven't, they still got mutants, and we want to protect our people. So we're gonna we want you to have sort of a black division of your company that does that tr basically black market trades these drugs to these other companies and and gets mutants out of those dangerous situations apparently. And she says, well, basically you want us to be the East India Trading Company of of this mutant nation. Um, so so basically is wants the Hellfire Club to be the, the business intermediary uh, trading this new commodity of mutant drugs um, in exchange for freedom for mutant people, right? And she's willing to think about that. And, and, they, and, and furthermore, to sweeten the deal, to make this a great deal they're going to offer, first they offer 20 years, and then they say, no, 50 years, exclusive contract, this will be you. And we'll give you two seats on our new mutant council, right? So they, they've decided that uh, Krakoa is going to be ruled by a mutant council. And it's going to have 12 members. And it's going to be broken down into like different groups in these four different seasons. And we're going to give you guys two seats. And she says, well, you know what? I'll do it for three seats. And so here's what we know now about the quiet council of Krakoa. And basically they ask, like, look, is there going to be democracy? Are we going to vote? Are we going to have like true leadership and like voting and stuff? And, and Xavier's like, well, maybe. We'll see what develops. We'll see how it works. Uh, kind of sinister. Like, they're, they're the, you know, they intend to rule from above by this council, at least for now. And for now, the only members we know of the council are Professor X and Magneto, Black King, and the White Queen. Now, uh, Emma Frost has another seat she could fill. Um, but then there's a bunch of other seats left to be filled, or at least to be named. And then there's Krakoa itself. And Doug Ramsey. And you notice they're sort of on the outside. The inner circle is really these 12 mutants are going to end up what's holding like a lot of the decision-making power of this new mutant nation. Whatever they end up calling it. Now this next sec sequence is pretty cool. And we see some of the um, them inviting some of the mutant villains, right? That we saw in the last issue teased a little bit. And we see Omega Red. And this guy, I forget his name, Bastion or something. Sorry, I forget. This is from my least favorite era of the X-Men. Uh, we see Mr. Sinister and Gorgon. And then we also see somebody who I asked about in a previous review that I was really happy to see them address. As soon as I saw these bubbles, I knew they had to be going to talk to who's usually called Marvel's first mutant, uh, or used to be, I guess, before Apocalypse. Uh, and that's Namor, the Submariner, right? And he rules Atlantis. And he's like, Look, sure, I'm a mutant, and you guys have finally decided, like, you're going to be separate, and you think you're better than the humans, right? You're not going to, like, mix with them anymore. You're just going to be separate. And it's like, you know, I, I came to that conclusion a really long time ago. And as a matter of fact, I don't really believe that that's what you believe. Like, I still think you believe that you can get along with 
humans when in reality they are just so jealous of what you are and what you have and 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 they always will be you know that 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 sooner or later you're, you're gonna realize that so he's like go away little man uh d don't come back until you really mean it like in other words don't come back until you're really ready to say that you're better than humans uh because namor came to that conclusion a long time ago love this love namor uh it was one of the mutants i wanted to see um, of all the mutant villains that they welcomed in, I thought there were some really cool stuff. I saw, we talked about last time, Metallo, and we saw Mesmero, and a few other weird ones. There's one I haven't seen yet that I really want to see, although he's involved in other books, which would be the Taskmaster, who's, you know, relatively, um, not, not often thought of in the context of mutants, but, but he is one. So next, we go a thousand years into the future, right? And to what I'll admit is still like the the least understandable part of what's going on in certainly in powers of x in the whole powers of x house of x thing what we've seen in the previous issues is the technarch society uh uh, uh the phalanx right they come and they assimilate planets they, they they find artificial intelligences and if they deem them worthy they elevate them by bringing them in and basically assimilating them um and we see the, the the process of this happening as the, the the elder that last time sort of communed with them gets destroyed and absorbed. And they go on to explain a little bit more. And this I found this really fascinating, the stuff about the density of artificial intelligence. Basically, there comes a point where an art where an intelligence becomes so dense, that it collapses on itself like a like a fallen star, like a singularity. It becomes like a black hole, and this posits that a black hole is actually really like a collapsed artificial intelligence. And then, as possibly as a matter of fact, all the black holes are actually connected to each other. They're like wormholes to each other, and it's all one giant galactic intelligence or or universal intelligence slash god. Right at some point, there's no differentiation between this super powerful intelligence and what we conceive of as God. I find that pretty fascinating. I, it's still pretty like high pie in the sky sci-fi, and um, its direct connection to X-Men is kind of eluding me. Other than the whole stuff with the tech arc or the technarchy and the and the and and tying it back to Doug Ramsey and Warlock and those guys. Um, and so this final text piece talks about this, and um, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, it, it talks about these different types of universal societies. Basically, a titan is when that universal intelligence collapses on itself, and then a stronghold is when five or more of these intelligences get networked and connected to each other. And then if you get ten or more, hundreds or more of these strongholds, they become this dominion, and this is typical... Uh, Hickman, layers upon layers. It's not enough that you've got to collapse super intelligence. you got to have a network of them, and then you got to have a network of network of... All right, you see where this is going? It's... um, Because I, I don't. I'm not really sure. I, 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 I'm All I'm sure of is that we're going to get some secrets revealed to us um, in the... It, it has to be in the next issue or the final issue. And finally, we, we end this issue on a quote, when you see me again, understand what that means, which is what we just saw from Namor. We get to see the reading order again. So right now we're here on Powers of X number five. Only two issues left in this saga. House of X six next time and Powers of X six after that. Um, here we go, the preview page. We translated this one last time. Next, House of X number six. Uh, I am not ashamed of what I am. We've seen that one before, but what about this one? Then, House of X. Kind of a letdown. That'll be uh, Pox number six is the last one, and it's called House of X, so I guess that's when we'll finally see the reveal of what the true House of X is. So let's go back a little bit and talk about the text pieces. Now that we've got our homework out of the way, um, let's, let, let, let's go back in here. We talked about the Universal Societies. Uh, let's talk about, uh, we talked about the council. Let's talk about um, the first text piece, which I found um, to have some of the most juicy kind of tidbits. So it talks all about Cerebro. And basically 
that 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 the purpose of Cerebro is to take these uh, the new purpose and functionality of Cerebro is to take these uh, Shire memory crystals and store mutant consciousnesses in them, right? So once a week, Charles does an incremental backup. If you're into like computers or whatever, you understand what that means. We're not taking a whole copy of all the data every week. We're just copying what changed between last week and this week, right? And just incremental copy, beep, 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 every week. That way we can sort of like, the most data we're ever gonna lose is, is a week's worth of data, right? And then once a year, Xavier does a hard backup of, so that takes three hours, I guess, to do the soft incremental backup. Once a year, he does a hard backup of every mutant on the planet, which takes three days. And this is a complete stored copy. I guess this is getting dumped to, to whatever Shire crystal tape drive and stored in the vault, whatever, right? Um, they're actually redundantly storing this in five different locations, so in case something happens they are always going to have access to the data i really was hoping hickman was going to get into it like a description of raid if you understand about multiple drive raid systems and how you use one drive as like a parity drive so you can actually lose a complete drive and still restore all the backup backed up data i i'm just the, the super dork in me is just hoping that we get a little bit of that thrown in but I'm happy to see what I'm I'm seeing here. Um, the the clue, but I'm digressing. I'm I'm really geeking out here. But the uh, the important notes I want to say I want to note here, as previously stated, while there has been no experimentation regarding what happens when you combine a mutant mind with a husk that is not their own, it is believed that unless a mutant has some primary or secondary ability to overcome the potential damage such a mismatch would cause, it's likely to be harmful and possibly fatal. So some people were wondering, like, they said that uh, Proteus's clone in the five was always, clone, was always made from Charles's DNA. Um, and, and how did that work? And they, they, they didn't really explain. And that made some people go like, ooh, Proteus, or something creepy going on there. I think what they're saying here is that, like, because he's Proteus and this reality warping powers and he's burning out his bodies anyway, it's we don't really know what would happen if you did it to a mutant that's not like Proteus. So Proteus is a special exception. Um, and then, but then note next, it is possible for a telepathic operator to replace their own mind with a previous legacy version, but doing so is incredibly difficult and would most likely require a skilled and experienced operator. Note, Charles Xavier has done this twice. Okay, now this really goes to what I've been talking about from the very beginning here, which is that if this is truly the modern Marvel 616 timeline that we've always been reading, then, and, and if Charles has had all this advanced knowledge of what's going to happen, there's a lot of things that you can't explain. Um, uh, choices he made... Other things like times when he's been possessed or his mind has been read or other things that have happened where anybody who had access to his mind or he shared his mind with or whatever would know all the stuff that he knows. So how do you how can you get around that? And as it notes here, it's possible for an experienced operator and all, Charles is the only one experienced, right? So obviously he could do this and he's done it twice. He can take a previous version of his mind and put it into a, his body into a clone of his body. Does that mean he can have multiple bodies at the same time? I That's, we don't know. I don't know why that wouldn't be possible. Uh, but it's also theoretically possible though that he could sort of reboot an earlier, some, somehow if he had an earlier captured version of his mind where that information was blocked, that he could sort of go on without knowledge of what's happening in the current timeline so it wouldn't disrupt the timeline the way it would if he had knowledge of what was going to happen. Wow! The, 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 the possibilities here are mind-bending, right? Like, mind-boggling. And, and, and I'm, I'm really, really loving that. Uh, th this is the type of stuff that we've been sort of talking about from the beginning, is that how do you square, if this is not in the Marvel Universe that we know and love and have been knowing and loving, it feels like sort of a cheat. It just feels like an alternate reality um, storyline. And, and while those are great, they don't have the gravity of a work that's like in canon of the Marvel Universe, if you will, right? Like that it, it really happened, not might happen. 
Of course, they're all imaginary stories, aren't they? Right, as Alan Moore said. But um, in this case, it would feel like a cheat if that's the way they went. I think that some combination of this mechanism of him being able to make backups of himself and have knowledge of things and eliminate his own knowledge temporarily of those things goes a long way towards explaining how all this stuff might have worked uh, together so that all this stuff could have happened from the very beginning but still have the Marvel Universe and the twists and turns that we knew throughout our history of the X-Men. We don't have to erase all that stuff. We can say that stuff happened in continuity in the universe we're in. I really feel like what they're going to have to do here is they're going to have to come up with some way um, to get rid of Moira, to eliminate her power and kill her, or just eliminate her power, perhaps. Um, Because ultimately, this is a question that's never been raised either, right? So if they don't do that, ultimately she's going to die someday. And will she not just reboot when she dies, right? So they have to come up with an answer to this. Um, it might not be in House of X and Powers of X. That might be something that's going to be teased out over the next year or two or whatever of X-Men stories. And frankly, I think I'm okay with that. From what I've read, uh, the main X-Men series itself is going to be written as standalone kind of single issue stories. Like there will be an overarching story arc to them, but each one tells a single satisfying story. This is Hickman toying around with pacing and formats and saying that like, the end of the decompressed uh, age of storytelling may be upon us, and I couldn't be happier. Another thing I couldn't be happier about is, man, the growth of this channel and all the new people coming on board and checking us out. So um, thank you for checking out this video. Thank you for checking out them all and liking, and subscribing, and engaging, and doing all of those things that you do that are making this uh, a successful YouTube channel. And more importantly to me, just making it uh, a a load of fun and making me love comics again in a way that I haven't in a really long time. So thanks again. We'll see you next time.